تست Right, I'd like to welcome everybody to the session, which was about uh, grids and networks on networking. Um, and our first talk is going to be by Jean-Marc Uzi, who's at um, Juniper Networks, but has worked in a number of um, capacities in uh, French systems. Yeah. Sorry, can you? Yeah, thank you. I have to. Oh, yeah, yeah, level, yeah. Can you hear me? Better? No? No, I think we have a bad acoustic. I'll try shouting then. So I'd like to welcome everybody to this session on grids uh, at the Torino Conference. Um, our first speaker is uh, Jean-Marc Uzi, who's at um, Juniper Networks, but has um, had a number of um, projects in, in France previously to that. Yeah. And he's going to tell us um, what's missing and what we have to fill in to make grids work on the networks. Thank you very much. Yes, I would like to share some thoughts with you about uh, how we can solve, uh, uh, partially, uh, uh, some of the problems of end-to-end. -end. This way? Yeah. <laughs> really? Okay. Oh, my God. Whew. That's sexy. Um, so, yeah, I want to share some, uh, some thoughts about uh, how we could uh, solve one of the old uh, but still uh, and even probably more um, very, very actual problem of research education networks who want to, to enable advanced service uh, from end to end. So it could be applied for, for any kind of service, what I'm going to talk about here, right? Um, so the objective is um, just observing what you are doing since a long time and still continuing and really focusing and you can see through the Géant 2 program that there is a very strong focus on that which is about enable services that are not available in commercial internet and make them available from end to end across multiple domains. Multiple domains meaning your campus network, national network, regional network, pan-European network, etc. And these services are uh, of course, multicast, V6, VPN, and one uh, very um, famous we talk about is bandwidth and demand. But really any kind of service, and the point being that um, an end user or two end users that want to talk with a specific service are rarely connected to the same physical uh, backbone, right? They have to cross all multiple networks. So. The question is how can we provide these end-to-end -end services? Is it really just a network issue and uh, obviously not? Um, and really how we could enable a service in a dynamic way because we are talking about some services that cannot be available always for everybody. So how can we trigger a service in the network that would be enabled dynamically from end-to-end -end across multiple networks? And it could be triggered by an application or end user depending on the use case. So, I would like to go in three steps. What is the current interdomain situation, very quickly? Also, some interesting work done in the ITF. Just want to take a couple of things that I believe very interesting for your community, and then talk about what is, uh, I believe, missing in that model. So, if we take uh, the situation today, I take three research education networks. They are connected together. Uh, it could be national network, regional network, campus network, no matter what is the interface between you, what, what, what do you really provide in the domain. And uh, each of you are deploying advanced services, uh, mainly IPv6, multicast, VPN, quality of service like IP premium or less than best effort. Um, and what we use today as an interface between the domains uh, is simply and just the BGP. And 
That's, well, I should add MSDP for IPv4 multicast pass mode, but apart from that, the only protocol we really use as an interface is BGP. And BGP is great. Uh, it's scalable, we know that. It can be implemented at very high scale. It added many features to extend the scalability of the protocols. It's multi-protocol because it supports both IPv4 and IPv6, and it's really multi-service because you use BGP to exchange anything, unicast route, multicast route, IPv4, IPv6 route, but also VPN routes, if you want, can be exchanged with BGP. So it's a great protocol. But it's only about reachability. The only thing you exchange with BGP today is a route or a label, if you use uh, MPLS. And that's, I think, really the limitation we are reaching here is the internet technology you are all using to build your services is that it's based on exchanging routes or labels. That means it's just a connectivity in the sense of reachability. Okay? And what we need today, and um, that's valid actually for all public networks or commercial networks or research education networks, is capabilities in network that allow dynamic service activation which require more than just reachability, that require a certain level of quality of service, a certain level of reliability, and a certain level of security. And that means that the peering capabilities have to evolve and exchanging just the root or just, I mean, a reachability information is great, but it's not enough to do what we need. So there are many interesting things happening in the ITF that are in line with your vision of having really services that would work across multiple domains. And I'm just going to mention four of them. There are many others, but there are four that I don't see much studied by the community today. Uh, some probably are doing some things in these areas, but I really believe that uh, they wouldn't really make sense for you uh, to solve the problems you try to solve. So one example is um, flow specification disseminations, which is an extension of BGP to route not only routes, IP routes or uh, label, MPLS label, but also to exchange flow information. That means source IP, destination IP, source address, destination, uh, uh, source port, destination port, and maybe an application port. If you can exchange flow information by using all the scalability of VGP and, and capabilities of VGP, then that means you can share filters in a dynamic way. So if you want to block traffic instead of uh, making the access list or the firewall filter in your router, uh, manually uh, or in all the routers, you just use BGP to exchange this with all the routers in your domain, but also maybe with the routers in other domains. So you could converge in a few minutes a policy that should be applied by the systems. And BGP today can do that with this extension. So that's an interesting work to look at to extend security uh, services. Another one interesting for multicast, we all know that uh, you have enabled multicast in many backbones, most of them actually, but there is still an issue for end user to get multicast flow, um, mainly because of campus issues, which are quite complex. And there is an initiative interesting uh, in the ITF, which is called AMT, Automatic Multicast Tunneling, which is a bit like a six to four, but for multicast uh, in IPv4 multicast. So that if a host cannot reach a source, we are talking about SSM service, type of service, with multicast because there is a hole somewhere, then there is dynamically a unicast uh, tunnel. So with using unicast that is established with the first router in the chain that can support multicast. So you just solve the chicken egg problem with this technology uh, that is under development, if I can say. Uh, and there is a source code available so you can test on the PC. Um, uh, with the FreeBSD, and um, that will allow uh, to enable multicast flow to, to be reachable by all, 
And of course, those that do not move to multicast will finish with a lot of parallel unicast flow, which is in some way also to force them to move to multicast. So I think it's a quite interesting problem of solving the chicken egg problem. I really encourage you to study. Another one is multicast uh, extension for VPN, uh, mainly for layer 3 VPN, but you are not using much this service. I may be more thinking about VPLS because Ethernet services are really uh, interesting for you. Now we can enable Ethernet service across multiple networks uh, by using the IP MPLS. And uh, if you build this such multipoint to multipoint service, uh, we need to solve the multicast. And so this is an area to look at as well. And finally, the not but not the least, uh, is uh, extension of GMPLS, which is based on um, uh, an intra-domain protocol, and which is now extended. So RSVP is extended to go across multiple domains, and this is an interesting work happening in the ITF to um, set up a, a GMPLS circuit across multiple networks. So. Having said that, and that was to say that we have a lot of many interesting initiatives uh, worked on in the ITF, uh, there is still something missing because just imagine we have all these kind of technology available. What happens if a university requests a service? So we have on one side the end user, university, research labs, asking a service in some way to uh, the NRN, uh, and you have all the NRNs together that need to manage this request. So I'm asking, for example, let's say a one gig pipe, uh, which could be expressed in a very different way from the end user. Um, so the first thing is to understand what you really need. Um, and um, some are using different words for the same thing. Then you have to um, qualify how you can provide this. And some may use MPLS to do that. Some may use um, an optical network to do that. Then you have to qualify some political issue or policy issue. Uh, is this university allowed uh, to use this uh, capacity from the network, this service? So is the project behind it uh, registered somewhere? So because you are not allowing anybody to use this kind of service, right? And then you need to check some details like the interface connecting the university, what are is going to be used for the interconnection between the domains and um, I don't know what is the backbone capacity and so so at the end we need to involve also NOC expertise to check all these things and probably we finish with a mailing list uh, if it's not there already and we have a lot of exchange and there was a good illustration of that yesterday in Moro's presentation how many or how cost it is to build such a service. It's not a question of network technology here. So we need to replace all this uh, human conversation by something that could dynamically negotiate all this business relationship between the domains in order to set up a service. So let me take an example because this is the, the topic of uh, um, Géant, one of the main topic of Géant 2 is uh, the bandwidth on demand, or we can call this in many different names. I want to be really generic here. So who wants this grid project mainly? Fine. Um, and potentially, at networking layer, some may have different ideas, but basically we could do this in many different ways. We could use layer one technology or layer two and layer three, and I really don't care here. Um, Let's take one of the um, latest um, GMPLS traffic engineering extension to do inter-domain. Let's see how it works. This could be potentially used in, your, in this case, maybe not, but some uh, projects are looking at this technology for sure. So I want, for example, a 100 meg from router one left to router two on the right. So I configure my router with an LSP saying that the uh, traffic class here is IP premium because in my example, it's packet-based network, but it could be a pure optical network from end-to-end, -end, doesn't matter. And I select the AS path, which represents the different NRNs involved or metro operator networks. So RSVP message go out with the path computation, calculating the path inside the domain I manage, NRN1, and I give uh, uh, the exit point so I calculate the path in my backbone and I forward the RSVP message to the next domain. In next domain, the first thing to do is a policing. 
you are not going to accept any request from uh, uh, from from any uh, from any end user or any NRM. So you need to police it uh, with some rules based on what you expect to have happening in your network, which may change from day to day. Then you extend the path by computing your internal path up to the next domain, and the same happens with NRN3. And we finish with a reservation a path to establish the LSP, which could be unidirectional or bidirectional. OK, fine, that's great. But what is missing here? And what is missing in, in these specifications that are in, done in the ITF? How can I enable this proper policing and filtering in a dynamic way? It's not just a question of saying, I'm establishing a path from this router to this one. It's about dynamically synchronizing all the domains to make sure that they will accept or not such request. The other thing is the scheduling. Here I'm asking a circuit now. What happens if I need a circuit in two weeks because there is a big show or a big experiment? This is not solved here. And finally, the chain of service provider is also not solved here. You may use a BGP, um, AS, hops, uh, information, but we need more than that. And you may have other constraints, administrative or technical or economical, that you may want to use to calculate the best path. So the solution is a capacity management middleware, and you are building this. There are several projects. We had a nice workshop on Sunday talking about that. There are many projects, many uh, software that are developed to solve that problem. However, as many projects we have, as many tools we have, and each have advantage, disadvantage, and certainly we have here some issues that um, are raised, the licensing issues, standardization. Um, uh, some are not supporting multi-domain, some are. Some security mechanism, uh, uh, when, and also some vendor dependency, because in some projects, vendors are involved, and so it's going to work with their, uh, primarily with their own device, right? So how can we converge to a common tool that will be supported by the whole RNE community, so not only at national level or even not EMEA level, but really global level. And also the industries, because you still use, I mean, commercial of the shelf equipment. So the industry has also to be behind that and follow the vision you have. And if I had to build this from scratch, uh, just using common wisdom to, to build this, uh, I would first uh, put in the wish list the ubiquity, being able to reach anybody from the community with a new service, which means I really have to be completely dependent of what is below in main, the networking. If we rely on a specific networking technology to build an end-to-end -end service, we are not go never going to build this end-to-end. -end. It's the ATM uh, age. It has to be platform vendor independent as well. It has to be domain independent because a service, the way it is implemented in one network may be completely different in another network. We don't care about that. And it has to be really perennial because you may start the tool and when the tool will be finished, you may go to next generation network with different technologies. But the tool should stay here and work with the new generation. And also, I'm here talking about bandwidth on demand services, type of service, but if you build such a complex new layer of middleware, why not thinking about something that could solve any kind of on-demand service? To have something really generic that could work today with Lambda, Lightpath, bandwidth on demand, but could work also tomorrow or tomorrow morning with another service, video on demand, voice, uh, um, IP premium, anything. Could we not find a common framework? Could you not develop tools that could be generic enough to work with any kind of service? Because I strongly believe that what you are doing here is prefiguring what we are going to see in new public networks, or so the commercial. So I have a small uh, scale issue here. No matters. 
To continue with this um, approach, uh, I think the key is divide and conquer. Let's assume you have network and that all services will work with the existing work networks. If not, you are going to build new networks for each service. So I assume we already have transport networks that may be routers, maybe constitute of optical switch or SDH, no matters. And we assume also that we have a network management in place today and you are not supposed to change your network management every day. So suppose you have your own tool which can be completely independent from Andaman on the other. Before the end user get access to the transport network for let's say bandwidth on demand or any advanced service like that, he has to request a certain characteristic of service. Three dimensions could be cost, reliability, security to a layer that doesn't exist today, which is a human level, which I call he business layer, but don't be allergic to business. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the business relationship you have here in this room, right? So it's kind of service layer. Or potentially this could come from a higher layer managing an application like a grid middleware, okay? But anyway, this has to happen and we need this new layer to have all the negotiation between the different uh, um, operators, so different NRNs, MANs, campus network that contribute to the service, so that very quickly a decision is taken and is traduced to orders that can go independently per domain to the network, existing network management system that translate this service order to something that can be understood by the equipment you're using. So we need interfaces, client to network interface, intercarrier interface, and the interface between the different layers, the most important being this one, uh, uh, I mean, between the business layer and the network management layer, of course. Well, actually, these ones are interest, uh, very, the most important. So this is what has to be done, and completely independently of the rest, I don't believe personally as a completely block solving one service. The divide and conquer approach is, I believe, the best one that fit the requirements I showed you in the previous slide. So there are many projects, and uh, I mentioned here the uh, Géant 2 GRA free activity that are developed. Why I'm showing that? Because the good news is that you are implementing these tools to make these services available to the community. The problem is there are many projects. So this is implementation, and I want to talk about what is done in the standardization, which is very close to what you are implementing. And this is led, led by the IP Sphere Forum, which some of you have already heard about, which is really focusing on this new layer over the transport and network management layer, leveraging SOA, archi service-oriented architecture, web services, and really focusing on just this new layer uh, in charge of negotiating the service from end-to-end. -end. Did they have in mind NRNs and grids to make this from? No, of course no. These are carriers that want to make money. Why? Because with the internet, they are not able to sell any advanced services from end-to-end -end across multiple networks as they do very well with telephony. So if they want to sell a VPN, they have to connect physically all the sites directly. It's a problem for them. So they have a real business issue and they need to solve it with standard technology. So it's not for the same reason as you, but what they are doing is a common framework. So there is a reference architecture group that defines the models that has to be used, the uh, objects, the messages, so basic things that everybody will agree on. So everybody will develop tools using the same concept. And then we have people in the reference implementation group that come with their use case. So a telco will come, I have a VPN issue, I want to solve the VPN issue. 
And we could have our RNE community coming and saying, I have a problem which is the bandwidth on demand issue, so this is my use case and I will focus on that. And please, reference architecture group, make sure that that's going to work with my case. So they provide a common framework purely on standardized protocols. They are not going to overlay or to overlap, sorry, with existing standardization like ITU, ITF, uh, GGF, etc. They do their job in protocols, and they are just going to define the rules, common rules that should be used in this business layer. And also important for you because sometimes standardization means uh, long-term people, politics, etc. They have a very uh, strong go-to-market motivation because there is, uh, as I said before, a very important motivation for them to go very quickly in that business. So basically, um, how many time do I have? Five minutes? That's fine. Um, just a bit of terminology they use, and you recognize the three layers I was mentioning before, but here they call it traffic handling stratum, network policy and control stratum, and service structuring stratum. So these are the three stratums we use. We are far from the OZ model, as you can say. see. Um, the first one being composed of uh, SDH equipment, optical, routers, firewalls, any equipments that do traffic processing. The second layer is about NMS, uh, policy control, all the tools that control the devices. And the new one, which doesn't exist today, is this service uh, layer called SSS. Leveraging service-oriented architecture, really with the, the goal being we are not going to invent a new protocol. There is one that should work. Where all networks will be able to publish their services in an abstract way. So the way it works, we have, for example, three networks, so three NRNs. They would be able to publish in an abstract way. Here is my service I can provide, and I'm using the standard template that is used by the community, which is bandwidth on demand template, for example, or IP premium, or anything. And so that they can very quickly synchronize their capabilities when a request comes from an end user. So that if I receive a request, I become the administrative owner of the request, and I check in the SSS layer how I can provide the service from end to end with my uh, colleagues, with my NRNs uh, I'm connected to. <coughs> so there are many uh, companies uh, involved in um, vendors, telcos, and to my knowledge, only one research education um, entity or uh, organization has uh, joined uh, the forum. And I would like to conclude with this um, first thing, <coughs> um, making these services available from end to end in an interdomain really requires both a vertical and horizontal approach. Uh, we talk about bandwidth on demand. Uh, sometimes we talk to people more in the grid area, more in the triple A area, more in the networking area. Uh, we need really to have a vertical view to really understand and solve the problem. And horizontal, obviously, because it's interdomain. And I strongly believe we need a very strong synergy between the NRNs, the end users, but also the industry uh, in general. My second um, comment is that this problem can be addressed in different ways. And you are choosing a practical development, which is great because you are going to achieve something that is going to work. I hope you are going to uh, join uh, easily the different clubs because a project is a kind of club. A club could be single domain or inter-domain, but you will need to have an inter-club protocol as well, right? So that's the challenge, and I think that's why I think that standardization work has to be conducted together with the practical development. And I strongly believe that the winning solution is going to be federative, vendor and domain independent, and very simple to adapt to any current network, and technologies. But the top model 
is going to be the one that is actually going to be completely independent, independent of the service you want to deliver. You have a framework that is going to be flexible enough to build any kind of end-to-end -end service. That's what I strongly believe in. And um, that's all. Thank you. So I think we only have time for one or two questions, but um, Thank you. it's a difficult area because uh, you're asking people to agree on things, which is always hard. <laughs> <laughs> to react. Well, ultimately, uh, for a true end-to-end -end service, do you think it should be the application that is eventually able to describe its own requirements? And I presumably in a standardized way enough that all the intervening pieces would understand that request, mm -hmm. as well as whatever is at the other end, which may be provided by a different yeah. vendor. And could you... So that's kind of, is, is the vision to go, you know, so it's the application can, do users really understand what their application requi requires? Probably yes. not. And so that, what's your vision in that area? And then the second question is, as soon as you have differentiated services, there's some type of differentiated billing. So where does, uh, what are your thoughts on that topic? Okay. I think, um, for the application things, it's, we don't really care actually in the sense that what we do is we invent a service, we can be really creative, and then we decide to standardize a template that describes the service and all the input parameters you need to get from the one that triggers this service. But then after that, the one that will trigger the service depends on the service itself. If it's a video on demand, it's probably going to be a human because it's the human eye that gets uh, uh, excited by, 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 by the movie. If it's a grid application, that may be a computer using these parameters that would be defined by the application. So we are independent, actually. For the second question, um, it's, again, you can do what you want with that. You have a service published. You decide if you deliver it to somebody that requests it. And then you decide if you charge it or not, or count it, or don't count it. And then you decide also how you manage it in your infrastructure. If it requires guaranteed capacity, for example, how do you provide guaranteed capacity? It's up to you to decide and can be dependent, independent of the other domains. Some may use costs of, over, with IP. Some may use the dedicated optical infrastructure. Right? Do I answer the question? I, I guess, but you know, if if there's independent domain financial decisions to make, then there must be okay. probably previously described agreements. So about let me what's, let yeah. me give another input. Anybody can publish in the template the price for it. Some may have zero for service. Some may put a price for any reason. In the telco, they will probably all put a price for it. In the path selection, which is done in the SSS. We are not taking only in account the real physical path. We are taking many parameters in account, including the price, which means that the path selection is going to be also taking in account this constraint, which may be a critical for the end user or not. Okay? Thanks for the question. Thank you. We have uh, Michael Beringer, who's uh, currently working at um, Cisco, but has worked previously for Dante in the UK. Um, so there's a long 
history in the networking area, and he's going to talk about um, circuit switching or not circuit switching. Actually, oh, sorry. related to root or not to root. Right. Mm, the routing issue is, is not is a, it's not exactly orthogonal, but. <laughs> okay, um, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, the topic of the presentation is to, to root or not to root. And where am I coming from? Some of you may have been in the previous session. What, what are NRNs about? Um, if you look, you go around here, look at posters. What do you see? Light path, lambda switching. Um, a lot of the stuff you see out there in research is layer one. So I have, as, as you just said, I, I worked before at Dante where I, in the research environment, then I joined Cisco, and now I'm working with both national research networks and with uh, commercial providers, and I see a big dis discrepancy. Um, if you come here, the whole talk is about layer one. Uh, I'm slightly overstating, right? So a lot about light path, lambda switching, and all these things, optical VPNs. If you go to the commercial service providers, they are doing the exact opposite. They are not going down the stack, they are going up the stack. Uh, they are pro trying to provide services on higher levels, on application levels, content filtering, parental control. Um, basically, what commercial providers are trying to do is they are trying to capture the, the, the customer and make him stick to the service provider. Right? So they, they do this by going higher in the stack. Now, if you go to the NRENs, that is exactly the opposite direction. Now, um, you made the statement, Showmark, and the statement was made earlier too. Um, NRENs are the future ISPs. Huh, how is this going to resolve then? Right? Because I, I really see a big discrepancy, and this is what this uh, presentation is about. So I called it to root or not to root because basically the question comes, well, if the service providers are going up the stack and, and the NRNs are going down the stack, do we actually need a routing level? Those are slightly silly questions. I realize that, but it sounds good. Um, internet historic observations. I'm not going to tell you anything new here. Um, the important point I want to stress here, and you all know the history of the internet. The important point is the reason that internet is successful, and that was also mentioned in the previous session, is it abstracts from the transmission and it abstracts from the application. So you can run any application over IP over any infrastructure. And that's the true power. So it doesn't matter whether you're on wireless or on, on an optical circuit or whatever. So IP does have a purpose in life. I'm not, gonna, I'm not telling you anything new here. By the way, my, the value of my presentation in academic terms is pretty close to zero, right? All of this stuff has been said before. I'm just wondering why certain tendencies are there in the academic community and would like to understand better how people see this going forward in the future. That's where I'm coming from. So, when I was still at Dante, everything was ATM. ATM was the keyword of the day. Uh, everything had to be ATM. If you wanted to have a commission proposal accepted, it had to have ATM in it, right? Um, so ATM at that point was considered the technology to go with for the future. And um, if you listen to the visionaries in those days, uh, several of those would have stated that at some point ATM is going to replace IP. Right? Why am I bringing this up? Because well, I think we are seeing a very similar debate again. So nobody has said optical will replace IP yet. Well, maybe this is coming too at some point, right? So we are again looking at a point-to-point -point technology, and we are looking at how can, this, how can we make best use of that. And the, what we are not looking at at this moment, and this is what I'm personally missing, we are not looking at IP anymore. Hello, is anybody looking on how to develop IP further, the routing layer? Right? So I think this is a very uh, important point. ATM to the desktop did finally not happen, despite many visionaries seeing that. Why not? Well, there was no killer application. There is no need to change your, your interface on the PC to an ATM interface because everything you ever wanted to do worked anyway. Right? There is another reason for uh, ATM not actually working. It's the scalability issue. And I'm going to 
uh, enter in that debate a little bit uh, further in the presentation. Basically, any point-to-point -point technology has an in intrinsic scalability problem. It's, not good, it's no good to get to one single point. You want to reach the world. Uh, so you can, of course, connect them together, but hello, what do you come up with then? You need something in the middle that does routing, right? And this is where, this is where I'm coming from. So I already mentioned these trends that are definitely visible. And as I said, I work with both sides of the house. The discussions are completely different. On the research side, on the Enron side, the discussion is very much about um, how to make bandwidth on demand work, how to uh, provision optical connections these days uh, most efficiently, uh, fastest, how to control that, how to measure, how to provide the management, and so on and so on. Uh, on the commercial side, the, they couldn't care less about what transmission infrastructure they're using. They're not interested. It, it serves a need. So if you have a twisted uh, pair and you can use it for different technologies, you use the cheapest one that does the job. They're not stuck on any of that. But they have the problem, all of the commercials have a big, big, big issue right now. That's the, the fact that IP is becoming a commodity. If you now go to your DSL provider at home and ask an IP service, an internet service, what exactly is the difference to another service provider and to the third and to the fourth? And I guess you will agree with me, the difference between them is mostly price. You get your packet in, you get your packet out on the other side. That pretty much does the job for most of the things. So what commercial providers are really, really scared of in this moment is becoming a commodity. Now, if you are a big telco and you have spent a lot of money building a big infrastructure, you really, really don't want a small provider to come in through the back door offering exactly the same service for half the price. So they are looking for a way of... They realize they can only push IP packets as well, right? If they come to the other side, they have done their job. So they are trying to find a way to capture the, the, their customers and say, look, I'm, I'm not only providing you IP, I provide you all, also parental control, content filtering. I provide you uh, video on demand, free telephony. They come up with all sorts of value-added services. But all of those value-added services are higher stack things. It's all application things. Yeah. Now, why can the NREN community not do that? Well, to some extent they could, and to some extent it is happening. So, for example, this morning's presentation on video of SurfNet is one of these, these examples that does exactly that, offer a content service to the users. But this is, and maybe some of you will uh, contradict me here, which would actually be quite nice, um, I think this is the exception. If you talk about where the main focus is of NRENs today, it is still on the lower layers. Now, why can they not do things like content filtering, like all these fancy portals that commercials are offering? Well, because a lot of them break the end-to-end -end principle. And here we are back to Jean-Marc's presentation. Um, the, the, they break the, the, the transparent internet model because they put something in, in between the user has to go through a web portal and gets proxied there, or all sorts of fancy things happening are happening, which force us as, as tech users often to tunnel stuff through HTTP port 80 and stuff to make things work, right? This is an effect of, of this uh, controlling the upper layers. So um, the question that I have here is, are we actually, is anybody actually looking at IP, um, which has served us very well for the, for the past tech? Only because it works, should we just stop wondering about it, whether we can improve it? So here I, I put out an axiom, which I think is true, but feel free to disagree. I, I put a few comments in there, which I, I'm sure some of you will disagree with. Um, well, my first axiom is IP will dominate the endpoint, and I do not think that many of you will contradict this one. Uh, IP is everywhere these days. Um, this is not going to change for the foreseeable future. Um, so anything that will happen on an NRN or on a commercial network has to provide an IP interface to the end user. And that is exactly where ATM failed. They did not get to this point where they actually have an ATM <coughs> cable going into the PC. They did not get to this point. Uh, and many of us would say, thank goodness. 
Um, so on the, on the PC, we will remain with an IP stack simply because the user is lazy. If I don't need to change, I will not. So if we had a killer application to move away from that, maybe, but there's nothing of that inside. So on the core, what are we seeing? We are seeing a lot of actually diversion in terms of lower layer technologies. Um, we see optical, we see cables, we see if you, if you go, if you go from your home, from your PC at home to somebody else's PC at home and you set up a connection, you are probably traversing at least five different lower layer technologies. Wireless, DSL, optical, probably some SDH in there. Uh, there's all, all sorts of different uh, lower layer stuff that you're traversing and that's exactly the power of IP. It abstracts that, you don't see that. Um, there is a corollary from this. If the endpoint is IP, and if the other endpoint is IP, and that is where the axiom is coming from, I may be able to do other things in the middle, but on the boundaries, I have to come out as IP again, because that's the level where I have control. If I have application running on IP, and I control them on the endpoint of IP, then the only way you can control this in a scalable way, not scalable, you can do it otherwise, but in a really global scalable way is also to do it in the provider on, on IP level. This is something we are struggling at the moment with a little bit um, because a lot of stuff is going into, for example, MPLS VPNs, the MPLS inter AS connection, where we're trying to do this not on the IP layer. All sorts of issues pop up when you try to do that. So the real control is on the IP layer, also between pro providers. So for the commercial providers, IP is a commodity, I already mentioned that. They have a big issue with that. They need to justify their prices. They can only justify high prices if they have something to add on. And, well, you have seen all the different business models that uh, run around here. They offer free telephony. They offer video on-demand services. Basically things where you have to buy the set-top box and then you are locked into this provider. And that's exactly the point. Now, um, from a commercial point of view, this makes sense. From an academic point of view, this does not make sense because you want a transparent internet. In an academic sense, you want just an IP packet to be forwarded transparently to the other side without having anything in between. Why can the entrants not do that? Well, first of all, it's a political issue. Political in the sense of what is acceptable to the community. Um, there are enough organizations around in this room probably that even find firewalls too intrusive to, to their traffic. So forget about doing anything on the application layer, right? Uh, this is basically just not acceptable. What you want in the academic community is packet comes in here, packet goes out, transparent internet. Um, I think that would be ideal in the commercial world too. I think that is the ideal network. But again, we get into all sorts of commercial issues there on the commercial side. So this would break the end-to-end -end principle and we have to be very careful. By the way, on the commercial side, I think there's hardly any service provider left that actually offers transparent IP. Right? Hardly any. Every service provider does something. They redirect you to proxies. They do uh, filtering of SM SMTP ports. They do other filtering to block uh, this and that. Uh, zombies and worms and stuff like that. So I would guess that the true transparent internet in the commercial environment is already dead, right? to some extent. Right? It's, not, it's not a dramatic extent, but it's already gone. So what NRNs are doing in addition to that, what I see is they do offer application services, but acceptable ones, stuff that is not intrusive with a network. PKI is one, CERT is one, video distribution is one. There are, there are content services and application layer services that you can offer without breaking the end-to-end -end principle. And that is also something we certainly see in the NRNs. However, if you take this as the job of an NRN, how much of that is the network and how much of this is, are the additional services? And I would say about that much is the network. Right? This is what makes the NRN. Maybe I'll get some interesting comments on that later. On the, so, an NRN, in a funny way, also has a, 
a need to justify its existence. Right? So it also has a business case to make. In the NRN's case, it's not charging more money or charging less money. In the NRN's case, the question is, am I advanced enough to justify that I actually receive public funding? Or am I also a commodity and it could be, I could be replaced by a commercial provider? So in the NRN space, the way of thinking at the moment, as I see it, is, uh, okay, we have to provide also advanced services that you can't get on the free market, and the main focus on this at this moment is uh, towards managed optical connections, managed optical VPNs, managed lower layer services, and a lot of this stuff is point to point. And if we go point to point, we are back in the old scalability stories that we have had all the time with ATM and with all other technologies before. Now, there is a discussion, and I hear yesterday there was also already a discussion on circuit versus packet switch, which I unfortunately missed. Um, there is one big misconception in the world that says IP is expensive, optical is cheap. So, why is this a misconception? Well, it is actually, it's actually a true statement. As long as you look at a single circuit, and if you, if you were to provision a single 10 gig circuit from A to B, and you did it via optical, it's probably going to turn out cheaper than if you put two routers there. However, a point-to-point -point circuit does not give you what the internet gives you, global connectivity. You, you're missing the scale. So you can now make a star, you can make a mesh, you can make a partial mesh, and as soon as you have a mesh or a partial mesh, what do you need again? You need some instance of actually routing the stuff forward uh, so that it is being taken care of. So if you actually do the calculation, and in the paper, in, in the t paper that uh, Dirk and I wrote, which is on the web page, you find a whole section on, on an example on why optical is actually not that expensive. Uh, sorry, routing is actually not that expensive. They balance out pretty well, even though at first glance optical looks much cheaper because with IP you can do overbooking, you can do stuff that you cannot do with optical, right? And it is, in scaling terms, much better. So, uh, therefore, the economical factor that IP is expensive is wrong when you talk about um, a whole network rather than a single link. Uh, finally, some technical considerations. Do we need routing or not? Well. I've mentioned it several times just to reiterate here. If I have point-to-point -point links, we can make this work perfectly in Europe. Right? Um, I have seen many projects here that connect five to ten universities. Perfect. Beautiful. But this would not work in the same way if that had to be a global network. So this is, all of those projects are not going to get to a scale very well. Oh, Generally, many of those projects would not get to a scale where you can actually reach global connectivity. If you want to get to global, what you need is some instance of routing. And that could be IP, that could be something else, right? That's not the point, but you need some functionality on layer three. Uh, policy control is another issue. Um, you actually, well, we have spent a lot of time and many years on actually trying to figure out how to do policy control on IP. Basically, for example, connecting to DiffSurf clouds, how do you match the, the, the guarantees and how do you make, on, a, on, on the political level, on the business level, how do you actually match those parameters that you agree on the technical level? This is very hard on IP. If you do this on ATM or on optical or on point-to-point -point technologies where you have guaranteed bandwidth, it becomes even much more difficult because the price that you have to charge for one of those end-to-end not end to end, point to point links as such is very high if you cannot make use of economy of scale as you can in IP. IP abstracts from the upper layers, we have already said, said that, so this is one reason why we'll always have something like IP around and it abstracts from the lower layers, I already said that as well. So, in summary, um, whatever we do, as long as we stay with point to point technology and we make a cloud of point to point technology, this will have serious limitations in scale. As soon as we want to go beyond connecting 10 or 20 universities, we need something else, and this something else is still um, IP routing. So I say IP, it could be other types of routing as well. That is not the point. 
The point is we do need a layer three. Therefore, I also think if you look at all of those um, projects, you have to ask yourself the question, what do we want to achieve? If the goal is to connect 10 universities, a lot of those projects are perfectly okay and perfectly sufficient. But what are we as a community doing to address the question, what is going to be the next internet? What is going to succeed IP? What is going to uh, be the next routing protocol? We have no answer to that. And I personally see not much research on that either. And that is one question. It's more a question that I have to you, actually. What is going on in this space? And how can we make sure that we focus more attention, which I, in my opinion is necessary, more attention on the IP layer, on actually developing the next version of IP that can have completely different security paradigms, completely different QoS paradigms than the current version, but we do need some routing uh, in one way or another. And so it's more a question really than a presentation, but it was a long question, I suppose. Do you have any answers? <laughs> Thank you. So do we have any answers in the audience then? Or comments? Or even questions? No? Yeah, that is a good trick. See, if you ask whether they have answers, nobody asks anything. That's good. <laughs> Simon does. I, I'm Simon Lane from Switch. So... Um, of course, as a fan of routing, I'm, uh, this resonates with me uh, lots. Um, in, in some respects, I'm probably much more skeptical than you are about like um, how much our customers, like the even the research community, they really believe in end-to-end -end transparency as a value because we find that we run into like end-to-end uh, -end breakage all the time and. Uh, Usually, usually not from the researchers, uh, but from the IT organizations. So sometimes we have to like work against these uh, people in the middle between uh, the researchers, um, which is interesting. Um, I do have a few ideas on how to make uh, like the next version of IP better, um, but I'm not sure that we as operators uh, are in the best position to to work on that. Um, because IP is just uh, the, the it's just too, too big and uh, the the 800 pound gorilla you you cannot like gradually replace it or something. Um, we have seen that with uh, the all the effort we put into um, just making the addresses bigger. And well, uh, how far have we got after like five years or of intensively funded uh, working on disseminating that? I mean, our backbones, the NRAM backbones. Do IPv6, but how many of our customers have IPv6 reachability? Oh dear! I, so um, thinking no, of new no things. Application, right? There yeah, no yeah, application yeah. For IPv6. Th that's true. So, so I can think of uh, some mm -hmm. um, some nice uh, killer applications that would might require changes to IP, like uh, seamless mobility and things like that. You know, have already been worked on, but. Um, yeah, ch changes to IP are very hard, so I'm sort of uh, thinking that the big progress will come uh, and replace us, just like the IP network has eventually replaced the phone network underneath. So the, the people who built the internet, they didn't ask the, they didn't tell the, the telcos, or the, the telco at the time. Uh, well, please, um, have you considered changing your network in this way? Okay, they built their network over it. And now it's replacing, after, after like 20 years, it's trickling down and the, the telcos uh, take that technology. And I, I guess, well, um, the, the most hopeful vehicle for doing this disruptive research is from overlay networks, work like in Planet Lab or peer-to-peer -peer networks in general. Um, people start to generalize peer-to-peer -peer ideas and, um, and they are adopting network layer functions and implementing them in peer-to-peer -peer protocols. And I think that is a, that is a very um, promising uh, part of research. I think it is being funded, not, I, they, they don't get nearly as much money as the circuit switching people or as I would like, but there's, there are academic uh, folks working on peer-to-peer -peer protocols and these things invisibly to us. Um, 
I don't know what we could do as operators to like um, to follow what they are doing or help them with uh, operational um, input for that. But I think that's uh, my my great white hope for uh, IP replacement mm -hmm. mostly. Yeah, I think a lot is. Uh, I mean, peer to peer has. If you go to an operator and talk peer to peer, they they turn red and, and go completely wild. They don't like peer-to-peer -peer at all because they just see it as a bandwidth hog. Uh, in fact, peer-to-peer -peer is, from a technology perspective, brilliant, right? And we could, we could streamline a lot of services and, and protocols if we, if we use more peer-to-peer. -peer. fully agree with that. Peer-to-peer um, -peer as a sole replacement of IP, I'm not sure, though. It's still re it's reliant, it dependent on the IP layer, right? But, yeah. Any other question or comment? Well, I have one quick one then. Good. I mean, the other area that um, people see the new developments coming from, the drive for IPv6 possibly, is from places like China, etc. If they need wider And not even that addresses. is happening. Not even no? that is happening. Not even Chi even China said they have enough yeah. space for now. Right. right. So it's it's really. But I mean, IPv6 really, and Simon uh, mentioned it already. IPv6 really doesn't buy us anything new. It buys us more addresses, and that's about it. In terms of any other aspect of IP, it doesn't change anything. So that's so I consider you IPv6. Any other fields out there where, where people might be driving new network paradigms. So. There's, there's nowhere. So this is Keith Jones from Cisco. I attended an IE conference about 3G mobile, and publicly. Um, Somebody from O2 stood up and said he has no need for IPv6. He doesn't want to deploy IPv6. He hates IPv6, and he's quite happy to carry on with IPv4 NAT. And that, that was a public statement made by a representative of O2. <laughs> so we're all happy with IPv4 NAT. Yeah. Allegedly. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at you know, we haven't changed the railway gauge in a long time. It works. It's not perfect, but it works. Um, since, since I brought up IPv6, I don't want to be negative on about it. I think if people, uh, like, it, if it, there was a consensus, really, that end-to-end -end transparency is a good thing, then everybody should, uh, should introduce IPv6 and invest their effort in that. So, um, I'm not opposed to IPv6 in any way, shape, or form. I mean, our products support IPv6. All vendors' products support IPv6 today. It was just a comment from an end user that, was, that stunned me that he doesn't want to use IPv6 on his network. He sees no need for it. Now, that's not, I'm not saying I'm against IPv6. I totally support IPv6. But he was the end user, and he says he doesn't want it. So. You, you were talking about someone from O2, so he's like a telco. So I understand why your telco would be against it, because they don't want their customers to have end-to-end -end transparency. Peter Gerst, and several things. First of all, as you said, O2 is not in any sense an end user. Uh, the point about IPv6, besides the address space, is has sort of tried to look again at a whole set of the protocols in it and try to package them together in a somewhat more rational fashion. Uh, Obviously, you could do the same with IPv4, but you've got to agree on which set of rational things you do. When you're starting to talk about O2 or any of the mobile operators, you have another problem. For some of the reasons you gave in your talk, they don't want to have all the things which are in that lot. So uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how valid that is as a general comment on IPv6, it certainly is completely valid in that there is a clear uh, fracture in the large-scale users, like the mobile users, as to whether they want to and how much of a IPv6 they want to adopt. So next we have uh, Aphrodite Savasti from uh, GRNet. It should be open, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that was just before the...
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this presentation is about the part of the Jantu project that is dealing with the uh, provisioning of end-to-end -end services to the NRN community in Europe, so it's heavily related to both the presentations that were um, just made. Uh, I just want to say for those who attended the optical workshop on Sunday that it is more or less the same material, so uh, th those people can go and have an early coffee break if they don't want to hear it twice. So, um, the JRA3 activity of the G2 project uh, it is investigating the provisioning of bandwidth and demand services to NRNs. Uh, we have a number of assumptions that John Mark uh, spoke about earlier in his presentation. Uh, we have multi domain environment, we have multiple technologies, we have requirements for end to end capacity, for advanced scheduling. So, it's a multidisciplinary environment, and uh, we're trying to address the problem. Uh, taking this, this, um, these limitations or requirements into account. Sorry. Um. So the idea is to be able to streamline the end-to-end -end setup of flight paths, as we call them, or um, bandwidth on demand circuits, by uh, shortening the provisioning time, automating the procedures, um, uh, and based on the existing infrastructure, the NRN uh, networks. So. Uh, these types of services have been provided to the NRN community for quite some time now, but they mainly rely on human interaction, telephones, telephone calls, email exchanges, like uh, it was mentioned in earlier presentations, and a lot of overhead. So we want to automate this process as much as possible. Um, we started with a service specification of an end-to-end -end connection-oriented services for provisioning non-contented capacity using layer one and two technologies. There is another activity within the uh, GN2 project, which deals with uh, layer 3 provisioning using DiffServe and QS. This is the SE3 activity, and a lot of the work that we do here in Jerry 3 is closely related and inspired from or has uh, interrelations with SA3, but we're focusing on layer 1 and 2. Uh, we want to provide authentication authorization uh, for the access to this type of services and uh, support for policies that each domain might have for, provi for provisioning its bandwidth. Uh, we want to provide a single point of entry for users and applications to request this type of service over a multi-domain environment. Uh, for our purposes, we have focused our efforts initially on a prototype which will uh, try to uh, provide the provisioning of a deterministic non-contented end-to-end gigi circuit between two end-user access ports. So this is our first uh, goal, to be able to achieve that. Uh, the, ser the service scope uh, extends to wavelength, end-to-end -end wavelength switching and provisioning and any kind of layer 1 and layer 2 uh, circuit uh, provisioning, but uh, this is our first um, goal. Uh, a few words about the architecture. Uh, we have designed a system that uh, is composed of three main parts, the interdomain manager, the domain manager, and standardized interfaces between those uh, components. So, as we can see in the picture, uh, the BOD system sits on top of existing networks implemented using different technologies, and it's broken down into two main parts, the interdomain manager. The interdomain ma manager concentrates all the non-technology specific functionality of the system, and the domain manager concentrates all the technology specific parts. Uh, we hope to be able to provide generic enough and standardized interfaces between the different uh, BOD systems of adjacent domains, the interfaces between the interdomain manager and the domain manager, as well as the user or application interface towards the system. So, as part of our work in JRA3, we will provide a full implementation of the interdomain module, reference implementations of the domain managers. Uh, we, can, we have even uh, considered the case where a domain has a, still bases its provisioning to human beings, to the NOC. Uh, or um, we, we, are, we will incorporate existing uh, uh, tools which are built and used currently in the NRNs for provisioning. There are some examples for ethanol based uh, uh, circuit provisioning. And uh, in this, this is where we also hope we will be able to accommodate for existing uh, systems for intra-domain bandwidth and demand provisioning uh, for other projects, both in Europe and in the US. So the platform and the architecture uh, is generic enough to accommodate for existing tools and to uh, be able to uh, provide the interfaces for such tools to be able to uh, interact with our platform. 
Um, we have made an assumption that this domain participating in this end-to-end -end service provisioning will need to operate an interdomain manager at, as a minimum requirement and at least honor the interface between the interdomain manager and the domain manager as well as the interdomain uh, intra inter 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 manager interfaces to be able to be part of an end-to-end -end provisioning chain. Uh, the idea is to have a fully distributed approach in the sense that uh, when a user request comes to the, to the source domain, um, the, there's some local negotiation which is uh, masked, which is transparent to the end of the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, end -end setup uh, for provisioning the circuit within the local domain. And once this is done, then there is some uh, inter-domain pathfinder pathfinding taking place so that uh, the list of the chain of domains participating in the end-to-end -end circuit can be determined. Uh, then uh, the request is propagated to the next domain which decides on its own for the internal mechanism to provide the service and the request is even further propagated uh, as necessary. Uh, once the, this first um, uh, inquiry uh, on an end-to-end -end basis on whether the resources are available in its participating domain is finalized, then there is a second phase of committing the resources and providing a notification back to the user. So in this case, its domain can make the decision on whether to participate or not locally. And uh, there is a coordinated um, provisioning of, of, uh, between the different domains. This is where the tool that we aim to build in JRA3 sits uh, with regard to existing uh, management control planes and, and uh, the existing data plane of, uh, of the network. So what we aim to do is to build a system that will not replace the existing tools or the existing control planes of networks, but that will, uh, which, but will um, sit on top of it and coordinate the end-to-end -end process in a way that will cover issues like um, policies, AAI, and any other kind of functionality which is missing. So in this case, where we have five interconnected domains, we can see that in the first case, in the first uh, domain, the Jerry 3 system is the one which is initiating the end-to-end -end circuit provisioning, whereas in the two intermediate domains where a fully deployed control plane exists, the Jerry 3 system is simply notified of the provisioning which is taking place. In the last two cases where the domains do not have anything built on top of the data plane, the JRA3 system takes uh, the, the responsibility of both provisioning and implementing the rest of the business logic which is needed for the end-to-end -end service setup. So uh, the, the, main, the, main, uh, the, the focal point of our system is the inter-domain manager. Uh, it, is, uh, it is supposed to implement a set of automated procedures for the te non-technology specific uh, part of the internal way negotiations. It could be considered as a bandwidth broker, but it is more than that. And uh, now we will look into the details and why did we come up with this idea of an interdomain manager. Um, the first point to be made is that um, when you want to do interdomain collaboration, it is uh, probably more wise to split the functionalities in separate modules in such a way that um, you can uh, focus on the parts which are non-technology specific and which are, are common all, all the way along the end-to-end -end path and leave freedom for uh, individual domains to do their own internal provisioning policies and whatever. So um, by uh, exploiting this modular approach and defining the interfaces and the wrappers outside the existing modules, it is uh, easier to, do, uh, to uh, incorporate all the tools which are already existing there and to allow for as many domains as possible to be part of the end-to-end -end process. We hope that this effort will also provide a lot of experience uh, in uh, terms of brokering services other than bandwidth on demand. And we hope that by developing this modular approach, we can gradually uh, expand in terms of functionality in the system that we will build, starting from a very simple uh, set of functionality and, and going, growing larger. This approach also allows for domain independence, as already mentioned. There's no centralized manager. It's fully distributed. There's a possibility to hide the internals of each domain. Uh, and there's a clear separation between the control and data plane uh, whenever that is necessary. So in order to implement this inter-domain manager, we had to face a number of uh, issues, uh, like uh, how do we mask the policies and technology-specific issues from this abstraction layer? 
Uh, we came up with a network representation abstraction to be able, and a service abstraction to be able to do that. Uh, we also had to uh, come up with a multi-domain pathfinding procedure, monitoring along several domains, and we will see later on what kind of challenges are involved in that, authentication authorization in a federated manner, and so on. So we tried to gradually uh, deal with each one of these issues and see how can we, can we face them. So we, we came up with um, a modular system with a number of different building blocks, uh, which provides the functionality that we want to, to include in the Interdomain Manager. Uh, we, first of all, made the assumption that the Interdomain Manager will serve as the ingress point for requests. Um, and then it would select, its primary function would be to select the chain of domains to be involved in the end-to-end -end path setup. So um, this information based on topology and traffic engineering uh, data, which is exchanged between the domains, can be used later on for requesting and signaling the end-to-end -end path. Um, as already shown, uh, the inter-domain managers of the involved domains participate in a pre-reservation and commit process. Um, there are also a number of other modules like the AI service, credit management, accounting and lodging and policies, which complete the picture of how the IDMs coordinate with each other to provide the end-to-end -end service. And this is another picture with the building blocks showing very roughly how, what is the, the set of steps which are followed every time a service request comes either from a user or from an upstream inter-domain manager. Uh, there is some access control applied as steps two and three. And then as part of the request handling logic, we check with the local resources and the pathfinder whether uh, it is possible to fulfill the request. We check with the local policies. Then we consult the local domain manager for technology-specific issues, for example, whether a VLAN ID, a range of VLAN IDs are available to implement the circuit within the specific domain. And once this is all done, we signal the request to the next domain along the path. Part of this process uh, that there was a real, ch a real challenge for us was to do this kind of inter-domain pathfinding because uh, this is part of what is missing right now in the related uh, research area, in the related research in other projects and in the standardization uh, uh, bodies. So uh, we had to come up with a way that domains could exchange uh, technology-neutral information to be able to uh, collect all the topology and routing information data that would allow the interdomain managers to do interdomain path selection. So uh, we came up with a conclusion that we have to, separate, to, to implement a prototype a routing module, sub module within interdomain manager that would uh, exchange traffic engineering informa information, uh, mostly, uh, mostly entirely technology, technology agnostic. And um, this information would include all interdomain links and would also uh, include uh, the intradomain topology for each domain uh, at the level of the abstraction that each domain considers appropriate. So domains can hide, uh, can either uh, advertise through this uh, routing protocol submodule either their full topology or their edge only, edge nodes connectivity, or collapse the intradomain information to a single node and advertise only that as a means to mask. Uh, to hide from the outside world their internals. So uh, by, by adopting this model, we could make sure that all the necessary information for deciding on an end-to-end -end path would be adver advertised between the interdomain managers. Uh, we're now uh, designing and building a prototype for this uh, using an existing uh, OSPF version 2 daemon with traffic engineering extensions. Um, and once this is done and tested, we will be able to provide the interdomain managers with uh, sets of interdomain routes for, uh, to be able then to use them to signal and set up the request, so, uh, sig signal and uh, implement end-to-end -end paths. Another problem that we had to come up with is uh, universal addressing. When you have an interdomain scenario and you want to signal and set up and discover resources, you have to have a way for assigning uh, universally uh, accepted, acceptable unique addresses. So we came up with this idea of uh, using IPv an IPv6 address space common to the whole interdomain environment to uh, address each one of the addressable parts of the end-to-end -end topology. So in this way, 
We have here the Jerry 3 system plane. It is not a control plane, as I had tried to, to, to say earlier. And uh, we use a representation of the data plane in which its um, network ad its address, which is technology-specific, either an Ethernet uh, sub-interface or um, an SDH, uh, TNA, or any other kind of technology-specific address, is mapped to an IPv6 address, which is universally known uh, at the Jerry 3 system layer. And in this way, we can do pathfinding, signaling, and, and everything, any, any other uh, function that uh, the system wants to perform. Still, again, this is to be uh, tested in a wide scale and uh, see how it works and, and some conclusions to draw out of that. It's not a final solution. It's something that we're looking into. Uh, another issue that we had to, to face was how do we represent at the interdomain level the resources will, which are below at the data plane uh, and how can domains negotiate on these resources if they are of different technology, of different type, of different uh, um, uh, representation. So we came up with an abstract representation of the network at the interdomain level. So when each domain uh, speaks with the next domain along the path for, on a, about a port which has a specific uh, capacity available, they have a common language to communicate. And uh, we came up with this schema. Again, this is not final. We are now implementing prototypes of that. We're trying to see how the technology-specific details of each network can map to this abstract representation and how can this abstract representation be used in the pathfinding and routing, interdomain routing process and how successful that is. We're now at the stage of implementing this prototype to validate these assumptions that we have made. Uh, the implementation is modular, it is based on web services, and uh, we're building each one of the boxes that implement the specific parts of the functionality. Uh, the first part will contain a simplified network abstraction schema. Parts of the Pathfinder and the Domain Manager uh, functionality, which are statically uh, and manually predetermined so as to uh, imitate the fact that the Domain Manager is there. Uh, a simple authentication method, and uh, we don't keep real uh, rec record of what is of the reservations. It's data, data lifetime is limited to the application runtime, and this is the, the uh, figure of the blocks. Uh, we are currently using XML to insert um, the domain data to the system. Uh, we are also using XML for the user requests, and we also. Um, imitate the existence of the Pathfinder by pre-computed XML paths which are inserted to the system. There's a number of uh, tasks that the prototype features. We're currently developing it in three different sites, uh, two in uh, two NRNs and the one in Giant, and we will try to test it in the next month and see, improve it, debug it, and see how it works. And there's some future development plan uh, with uh, um, domain manager functionality, extensions to the transaction mechanism, full implementation of the Pathfinder based on the principles that uh, were just uh, mentioned, and the AI extensions. There is an, uh, the Jerry 5 activity of the GN2 project. There were some sessions uh, about Jerry 5 and the federated AI model yesterday afternoon. So uh, we will try to see what are the interfaces that we need to build to be able to use this federated model uh, and uh, imp uh, incorporate it in the IDM prototype. For intra-domain provisioning, we don't put so much focus in that. Uh, at this stage in our work, we will focus initially on manual intra-domain configurations. We just need to define the interface uh, between the inter-domain manager and the domain manager. Whether uh, below the inter-domain manager sits a human being or a tool, we don't really work on that at this moment, but it's part of our future work. Uh, the design is such that it will accommodate existing control planes, like the one which is now deployed in Xeand. Uh, domains which are simply operated using a, the NMS or domains that have their own uh, bandwidth broker systems already deployed. So we take these different cases into consideration when we're designing the inter-domain provisioning part of the system. When this work is done, we will end up with a domain manager. Uh, it will the main functionality will be to process the intra-domain requests coming from the IDM, uh, to provide towards the IDM the topology updates whenever they, they, they uh, happen, and to include one or more technology-specific sub-modules for interfacing with the equipment which lies below. 
So this is the place where we hope we will be able to incorporate existing systems uh, like uh, the UCLP tool, like uh, existing brokers which come from other projects like the Dragon project, the Viola project, and other tools that the NRNs already have to be able to configure their, their own local domain. Another uh, part of our work has to do with technology stitching. Uh, the as it was mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, we have to deal with a multidisciplinary uh, landscape with a lot of technologies, with a lot of technologies, with different technologies used in the, in the uh, domains that we have to, to work with. So we need to document and automate as much as possible the configuration specifics for its end-to-end -end path setup. And this is what we're investigating in, as part of this, uh, of this task. How do we automate the technology stitching? How do we automate the, techno the provisioning at the data plane? So in order to, for that to, be, to become more um, uh, easy to deal with for us, we, ca we started to, by writing down which are the different technologies that the NRNs are using today to provide end-to-end -end services. And we came up with this matrix and a number of 14 different scenarios which are possible right now in Europe if you want to provide an end-to-end -end circuit. And what we are now doing as we speak, these include SDH, Layer 2 VPNs, Premium IP, which is the Layer 3 uh, QS service, explicitly rooted QS services using IPMPLS, and native Ethernet. So what we are doing right now is going through each one of these 14 scenarios and writing down the process for configuring an end-to-end -end circuit when you have these technologies involved. And eventually what we want to do, we are identifying the preconditions. For example, here we have the example of setting up one gig, uh, one gig circuit uh, through an SDH cloud and a native uh, Ethernet uh, domain. And what we're doing is we're writing down the preconditions for this setup and the actions that need to take place. And the eventual target is to be able to write to, to write code, to write scripts that will automate this process without human beings uh, being involved. Uh, last but not least, we have, been, uh, um, we have had the need from the beginning to work on monitoring because when you provide an end-to-end -end service, you also have to provide the tools and the methodology to monitoring and demonstrate to, to end users what is the quality of the service which is giving, you, we are giving to them. So Jury3 uh, has this, uh, this uh, task, and uh, there is another activity within the Jean project, Jury1 activity, which is building a monitoring infrastructure uh, towards the end users. Uh, our goal in uh, Jury3 is to feed to the Jury1 infrastructure with the Layer 1, Layer 2 specific monitoring data and associate them with topology information so that they can uh, process it, store it, and visualize it as on-demand as the user's request for information for end-to-end -end services. So assuming again that we have different technology domains, uh, we use, we built in Jerry 3 tools um, which enable the extraction of monitoring information from the underlying equipment and we export this data to the Jerry one monitoring arch archives which are then uh, responsible for storing, processing the information and exporting it in a visual way to the end users. Uh, we are focusing right now on uh, two types of uh, circuits monitoring, Ethernet over MPLS and SDH-based uh, circuits. And uh, our, first time, uh, our first target is to be able to provide monitoring information about the up and down status of those circuits. Later on, we will deal with degraded or not degraded per, uh, performance and the level of usage and more complicated uh, monitoring information. Um, here is a few uh, words about what is currently taking place. Um, and a, a very important and challenging issue here is to concatenate the uh, monitoring information. This is a, a challenge for us because it is very difficult to, to concatenate, for example, SDH uh, monitoring information about error seconds with frame counters on Ethernet. So when you want to have an end-to-end -end circuit monitoring you have to have some way of correlating this monitoring data, and this is something that we will look to in the future. Uh, there are a number of other activities, like uh, looking into what, what the OEF and ITF are doing. Uh, we're collaborating with Internet2 Canary and ESnet. We are liaising with a number of projects. Uh, we are participating in the process of defining a pan-European testbed to test what we are doing. 
And um, we are recently started a second iteration of collecting user requirements and application, uh, user and application requirements for a service. So if you have any feedback on that, please email me and uh, we will start some communication to, to finish this kind of survey. This is something that we did also last year, but we have to do a second iteration. So any feedback from your side, from your communities, from your groups and your projects would be appreciated. And this is the group of NRNs who work for JRA3 and a list of co-authors of this presentation. And that concludes it for today. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Aphrodite? Maybe. <laughs> Sorry, thanks for the presentation. Uh, the project has um, fortunate uh, communities with uh, the presentation. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask a question about site 4 definition. Yes. Uh, could you elaborate just a little bit more what you mean by standardized interface? Okay, uh, maybe the standardized the word standardized is uh, an overstatement. What we want to achieve is to have, assuming that we have different types of domain managers sitting on each domain, to be able to have this arrow between the interdomain manager and the domain manager represent a set of, uh, of uh, messages which are common all the way. So. Uh, this arrow should implement the same functionality regardless of what type of domain you have, what type of domain manager you have. Uh, this is what the word standardized. Okay, so it's not industry standards in this well, case, right? Uh, it would be ideal if we could get to that point, but during three is a research activity, we're trying to, um, to implement a showcase, a demo case for, for the research community in Europe. <coughs> Uh, we don't have any official collaboration with vendors as we speak, but uh, it is part of our plans if we have time and, and, and effort to do that, to okay. investigate that. So for now it's considered as a set of specifications that you are going to share with others yes. and to ask them to implement yes. in order to be interoperable with you, it, right? Yeah, it's a little bit more democratic. We're, as we are defining these interfaces, yes. we're working with other, pro not vendors, with other Yes, 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 yes. absolutely. Yes. So that means you need to it's talk. A mutual yes, absolutely. But if we had only two projects, that, that would be really easy. But mm -hmm. we are talking about many projects. Yes. If you consider just Europe, we have several in Europe. We have some in national yes. levels, uh, and we have in the US. And there are South American people here, Asian people, etc. Yes. So, so we talk about having bilateral discussions with all these projects to 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 to. Yeah, right sure. now we are doing it on a bilateral basis. My, my intuition is that uh, later on in the process only a subset of them will, only a subset of us will continue in the same direction and some others will deviate. But uh, it's difficult to, to, to judge it from, that, from this point. Just imagine if internet was not here and we would all build our own BGP protocol and then yeah. ask the other to just yeah, yeah. convert it. No, 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 it's more, uh, more, more uh, open than what it says here. It's where, you know, as we are processing, we are discussing. I'm sure it's open. It's just that it's a very difficult task to yes, do. And yes. I just Indeed, want to raise the yes. point. Thanks. Hi. Your path finding seems to happen in one uh, into main domain manager, into domain manager. Yes, in the but source the, one. Yeah. What kind of information do you take into account? I assume, of course, the topology, but do you also take into account the user rights, the user permissions of other domains, and also maybe uh, what paths are reserved in other domains? And okay. if so, how do you announce the information between domains? Okay, uh, right now we took the existing implementation and we added a few more uh, attributes uh, for traffic engineering, such as resiliency. But you have left, we have left placeholders for policies and for any other kind of attribute that each domain wants to attach. There is an issue on how do you map and how do you uh, decide on an end-to-end -end circuit if you have different policies and different types of uh, regulations in its domain. 
Uh, to be honest, this is something that we, are not, we have not really looked into. We know that there will be one or more fields in its LSA, for example, in OSPF, later on in the future, but we're not really, I mean, we don't have, we haven't really thought about it yet. I know that uh, the SA3 activity uh, in, the, in the project, which is more, far more ahead of us in terms of implementation and of deploying the service in layer 3 that they are building based on QS, uh, have done some more thought about that. So if you're interested, you can contact them and get some information. I know that they have found some, they have come up with a schema of um, representing users and user groups and assigning attributes to them. And also the JRA5 activity and the federated AI model that they're building has placeholders for federating, federated uh, propagation of attributes, but they are just play, placeholders for the time being. Okay. okay, I think we're a couple of minutes into coffee time, so I think we should thank all the speakers again. Um, obviously the discussion has shown that to be a very interesting um, uh, presentation, so thanks to the three speakers.